morning, friends. Happy Easter. Oh, what a day. The sun's shining. It's just an amazing day to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Um, I just want to welcome you to Hope Church. Um, whether you've been here for your entire life or you're just visiting today, we are so happy that you're here um, and hope that today's service blesses you the way that your presence today blesses us. Um, normally right now I do announcements. I'm going to spare you that because it's Easter. And I only have one announcement. He is risen. He is risen Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to worship our risen Lord.
church. I would invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. We want the war horse. Jesus, rise and up. We want the eagle. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove. We want to take up swords. Jesus takes up the cross. We want the roaring lion. God comes as a slaughtered lamb. We keep trying to arm God. God keeps trying, trying to disarm us. And if you'll remain standing for our opening hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, number 302 in your hymnal, we'll be singing the first four verses.
indeed. I would invite you to join me in the opening prayer. Living God, on this most joyous day, we offer our thanks and praise to you, creator of heaven and earth, creator and lover of all humanity. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for the life we know in Jesus Christ, your son. Even when we turned away from you, you never rejected us. You spoke words of mercy and love through the prophets, promising to swallow up death forever and to host a banquet for all people, a feast of life-giving sustenance. We praise you for Christ Jesus, your word incarnate made flesh. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Leading his followers, he guides us. Dying on the cross, he rescues us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. Most resilient God, source of all that is eternally raised up, we give you thanks for your unspeakable gift of Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, I would invite you to join in our second hymn, He Lives, number 310, and just as we'll be coming to the gospel reading, so feel free to sit if need be, um, I, I understand. Um, so He Lives, number 310.
hear these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we, do, we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. never speak it, but I didn't quit when they called me heretic. Mm -hmm. They said I was too dangerous, so I stood with all the women at a distance. Once my name crossed his lips, how could I keep quiet? He is not ashamed to be seen with me beside him. I have seen the Lord, I will speak of him, and no money could talk me out of it. I have seen the Lord, and the Lord seen me. Oh, he said my name and told me, go and speak of what you see. How could I not? That you didn't quit when they called you heretic. Ooh, they said I 
worth too scandalous for you to come so close to me, but you still did it. Ooh. And once my name crossed his lips, how could I keep silent? He is not ashamed to be seen with me beside him. I have seen the Lord, I will speak of him, and nobody could talk me out of it. I have seen the Lord, and the Lord seen me, oh, he said my name, and told me, go and see. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I miss my dad. I have three degrees an undergraduate degree and two master's degrees. I've been taught by some of the best professors of economics and theology in the world. But I would argue with you that my dad was my greatest teacher. A simple man who worked for the railroad, grew up in the depression. He rarely missed the teachable moment. Everyday events and experiences always seem to present a good opportunity for learning something about a particular aspect of life. I miss my dad's wisdom, his insight. My dad and I were working in our garden one morning when a Lincoln town car pulled up in the grassy area between the row, the road and the rows of corn and beans. A distinguished looking fellow in a new suit and freshly shined shoes stepped out of that town car and looked at this man and boy in overall standing in the garden covered in dirt. Excuse me, he said, I think I'm lost. I'm trying to find the home of Albert Clifton, but someone down the road pointed me to this place. My dad looked over at him and said one word, Dave. The man seemed startled at first, but then he smiled and said, oh, hello, I'm happy to see you. This dapper, happy fellow was Dave Treen. Treen was elected to serve the U.S. House District that covered 
New Orleans and the Acadiana area of Louisiana. But he was looking for much needed support from people across the rest of the state because he wanted to be elected governor. After they shook hands, my dad went back to hoeing the weeds in his garden and Dave Treen began to rehearse his stump speech. As he spoke, my dad would use his hoe every now and then to toss a little dirt onto Dave Treen's Allen Edmund Park Avenue Capto Oxfords. <laughs> and each time, Mr. Treen would just kind of shake the dirt off the top of his shoes and kept talking. Over the next few minutes, my dad threw two or three more scoops of dirt on Dave Treen's best dress shoes. And each time, Dave Treen shook the dirt off his shoes and kept talking, but apparently he finally had had enough and he blurted out, I wish you'd stop throwing dirt on me. My dad looked up and smiled and said, well, neighbor, my dad called everyone neighbor. <laughs> well, neighbor, I wondered if you were ever going to have enough backbone to stand up for yourself and say something. He said, Dave, if you're going to run for governor in the state of Louisiana, they're going to throw a lot more dirt on you than I just have. That's how the game is played. After that, my dad and Dave Treen were good friends, and my dad supported Dave in every way that he could. Dave Treen was elected governor of Louisiana in 1979. He only served one term, but he kept the promises that he had made to my dad that day. He cut the state income tax. He created a professional development program for teachers. He signed legislation that created the Louisiana School for Math, Science, and the Arts. And of utmost importance to my dad, who was a nature lover, Dave Treen created the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. My dad taught me that the most important conversations don't always take place in the corridors of power and places of prestige. Rather, the most important conversations might take place around a family dinner table or in a garden. My mom's favorite hymn was In the Garden, and my dad's favorite Bible story was the one that we read this morning from the Gospel of John. Mary Magdalene doesn't feature in John's Gospel until her appearance with the other Marys at the foot of the cross. John has told us nothing of her story the little we know, we know from the other Gospels. But her place here is spectacular. She is the first apostle, the apostle of apostles, the first to bring the news that the tomb was empty. Two other more well-known disciples come to the tomb, but they're quick to leave. John of the two, more gentle, quiet, tender, reserved, retiring, deep feeling, stooped down and looked in, but went no further. Peter, more hot and zealous, more impulsive and fervent, forward, would not be content without going into the sepulcher and seeing with his own eyes that the tomb was empty. Both, we may be sure, were deeply attached to the person of Jesus. But if you remember at the cross, Jesus has now given John the task of caring for Mary, his mother. He has other things to get to. Peter was in this strange in-between time after he had denied Jesus three times, but before Jesus would forgive him and restore him to his role of tending the flock of Jesus' followers. It's Mary Magdalene who has the privilege of being the first to see, to meet, to speak with the risen Jesus. Of all our Lord's followers on earth, none seem to have loved him so much as Mary Magdalene. None felt they owed so much to Christ. None felt so strongly that there was nothing too great to do for him. And that devotion was rewarded when Jesus called her by name, Mary. Mary knew that voice. Instead of finding a dead body for which she was searching, she found herself face to face with the one who loved her and who had died for her, Jesus. All her grief and sorrow and loss were replaced by joy and happiness and gain, which she expressed in one word, Rabunai, teacher. In the gospel stories, Jesus never misses the teachable moment. And surely John's account of the resurrection has something to teach us as well. The resurrection of Jesus might be the greatest story ever told, 
but it's rarely the story we actually tell because it's not a story about new dresses and Easter baskets and flowers and candy and spiffiness. Even I'm guilty of it. Harper has two dresses to wear today to two services, and I have two different ties to match. <laughs> but that's not what the story is actually about. Really, it's a story about flesh and dirt and bodies and confusion, and it's about the way God never seems to adhere to our expectations. See, when Mary Magdalene, this imperfect woman, stood at the tomb, she didn't encounter some perfected, radiant, glowing Jesus that morning. Seriously, no offense to those of you who are gardeners, but Jesus couldn't have been looking all that tidy and impressive if she mistook him for a gardener. And here's the thing. I like to think that Mary Magdalene mistook the resur resurrected Christ for a gardener because Jesus still had the dirt under his fingernails from the tomb, from doing the dirty work of salvation. Of course, the depictions in churches of the risen Christ never show dirt under his nails to make him look like some wingless angel more than they do a gardener, right? Maybe because we've had to clean him up to look more impressive for the visitors that come on Easter Sunday. But then we all end up with nothing more than a hygienic but uninspiring idea of what resurrection looks like. Steve Winters has spent this Lenten season teaching anyone who will slow down long enough to listen all about atonement theories. About this economy of salvation, of what is it that Jesus was actually doing while he was here and while he was on that cross. And one of the questions they ask is, is Jesus like God? My question this morning is, what if God is like Jesus? What if God is not who we thought? What if the most reliable way to know about God is not through religion, not through a reward and punishment system, but through a person? What if the most reliable way to know God is to look at how God chose to reveal God's self in the person of Jesus? Because that changes everything. If we see Jesus as God revealing God's self, then what we're dealing here is a God who's really bad at choosing friends. A God who would rather die than be in the sin accounting business anymore. A God who would not lift a finger to condemn those who crucified him, but went to the depths of hell rather than being apart from even his betrayers. A God unafraid to get his hands dirty for the ones that he loves. This, this is the God who rises to new, to new life with dirt still under his nails and chooses a woman, perhaps even a woman with a sordid past, to tell everyone else about the resurrection. So while our churches may try and clean Jesus up and make him nice and spiffy, the God of resurrection, the God who brings life out of death, isn't satisfied with making you good or nice or spiffy. If you think that's what resurrection looks like, if you think it looks like perfection and piety, and therefore you haven't experienced it, you might just be wrong. Philip Gully, in his book, Home to Harmony, writes this. We always look for God amid magnificence, but Christ has a history of showing up amid the unlovely, born in a dirty stall, crowned with thorns, died gasping on a shameful cross atop a jagged rise. We don't need to be beautiful for Christ to take us in. He is equally at home when we're broken down and dirty. And that's good news. Can anyone doubt that this gospel account was written for our learning to be God's greatest teachable moment for us? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead represents the climactic moment of the Bible and the crescendo of human history. It's the assurance that the promises of God are true. It gives certainty and clarity to the reality of eternal life. It shakes our confidence in this world and builds our hope on a world yet to come. Resurrection teaches us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Did you hear me? Resurrection teaches us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Yes, Christ died, but Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. 
Hallelujah. Resurrection day. Amen. All right, while the choir comes, let's pray. God of creation, creating anew, the silence is broken. With the disciples in the garden, we catch our breath, we wipe our tears, and try to articulate our experience with you. What words can describe shadows fleeing from the tomb? How can we tell of the morning the world turned upside down? Human words simply fail. Still, we know we must spread the news. Christ is risen. May every breath we take, every word we utter, everything we do witness to the truth of Christ's resurrection. And all God's people said... not ask you to stand for our response of him, but seeing that we're talking about up from the grave he arose, I think it makes sense for us to stand as well. Um, so if you would rise if you're able and join in up from the grave he arose, number 322.
be seated. Will you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, in this world where hopes are so often dashed and dreams so often broken, we remember today the faith in the future you brought to so many, both through your coming and through your resurrection from the dead. Lord Jesus, where faith has died and dreams have faded, may hope flower again. We remember how Mary and Joseph looked forward to the day of your birth, how shepherds and magi caught their breath in wonder as they knelt before you, how the hearts of Anna and Simeon leapt in anticipation, and how your disciples and the crowds that flocked to hear you gave thanks convinced that you were the Messiah, the one God had promised, the long-awaited deliverer come to set them free. Lord Jesus, where faith has died and dreams have faded, may hope flower again. We remember how that vision of the future was shattered by events to follow, your pain, humiliation, suffering, and death, hope ebbing away as the lifeblood seeped from your body an end to their dreams, an end to everything, it seemed. Lord Jesus, where faith has died, where dreams have faded, may hope flower yet again. We remember how the news spread that the tomb was empty, the stone rolled away, your body gone, and how, despite it all, your followers could scarcely bring themselves to hope. Afraid to take the risk of faith in case they should face the heartache of losing you once more. So, Lord Jesus, like them, we pray where faith has died and dreams have faded, may hope flower again. We remember finally how you appeared in all your risen glory, in the garden, in the upstairs room, on the Emmaus Road, by the Sea of Galilee, and the dream was born again, and the smoldering embers of faith rekindled. Lord Jesus, where faith has died and dreams have faded, may hope flower again. Lord Jesus Christ, a world is waiting, hurting, longing, searching for hope, crying out for meaning, hungry for some reason to believe in the future. Come again in your living power and bring new life to all people. Lord Jesus, where faith has died, where dreams have faded, may hope flower again. In your name we pray these words and the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Grant, O Lord, that what has been said with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts we may practice in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we join in our closing hymn, Easter People, Raise Your Voices, number 304 in your hymnal. Thank you.